Hi everybody. So it's been kind of a weird week, which is why I haven't I haven't done anything, and um, you know things are still kind of holding steady as far as my eviction goes. Not evicted yet. I mean we're almost three years into this whole process. It's been amazing. We're at uh, one, two, three, four, five. We're at what? seven six hearings yes yeah, so I've got my seventh hearing coming up so that is one good thing about living in Ontario honestly is that there's a whole process involved and that the we we have laws set up in place that actually protect the tenants which you know if I lived in the states I've been out on my ear by now <laughs> Yeah. yeah, oh what, who cares, you're disabled, you're going to be living in your car in the winter, too bad, so sad. But, but then again, living in the States, my rent is paid, that's not the problem, so I don't think anybody would, you know, care as much as long as my rent stayed paid, but I don't know, I guess it just depends on the landlord, right? And speaking of landlords, okay, here's a weird, weird story. Now, so I was kind of going over... A whole lot of the problem, if I do get evicted, is that I don't have any landlord references because I've only had four landlords in the last 20 years, right? Which, you know, on, on paper sounds kind of amazing. Like, I am a long-term tenant and my rent gets paid. Like, why isn't that enough for some landlords? So, I sat there and I thought about it. And so there's the landlord that I have now, the landlord that I had previously, who was... an uh, somebody that I worked with and she passed away in 2017 the landlord I had before that they sold the building I have no idea how to get hold of them and then the landlord before that uh, was <laughs> he is one of the most notorious landlords in this area and his name was Terry Good and he was a terrible landlord although I'll say you know what compared to the landlord I have now the guy was a freaking saint so this guy, I mean, he didn't, didn't do anything, didn't care about anything, just, you know, collected your money. And, and this is why it, it was the perfect thing for me. As long as he left me alone, I was perfectly fine, right? So anyway, um, I knew that all of the properties that he had previously run, including the ones that I used to live in, um, I knew that they had been sold, but I, I thought, I just figured he retired because, I mean, he was getting to be that age. And so this week I thought, hey, let's, let's look up this guy. Let's see what happened. He seems to have disappeared off the face of the earth. Now, of course, the horror writer in me makes up all kinds of scenarios, but they figure, well, this guy owned, it, he owned a number of properties. I think it was 20 or 30 properties around, around the region. And then he had his own home and another property that he owned, like a cabin up north. The cabin up north, he had abandoned his BMW. It's not there. I, or it was sitting on four flats. Nobody's driven it <laughs> in a long time. And the he had this beautiful house over by the hospital. And it was it was just like all redone. It was this beautiful wood facade and this nice uh, cobblestone walkway leading up to it. And the inside was all redone. And he, I mean, he had this amazing like sound system. And I, I was there one time. Um, I can't remember if I was filling out a uh, lease or paying the rent or something. I was doing something there anyway. And I was inside and and that was and he had this little. Uh, this really adorable little hairless cat named Alice. And that, that was when I first just fell in love with hairless cats because they're the cutest things ever. So anyway. Um, so anyway, so he had all these properties and he was just like the worst landlord, but he didn't require any references as long as you had your first and last. He didn't care, right? Perfect. So he... But he's been up before the landlord tenant board numerous times. Everybody has a Terry Good story. And, but I didn't realize that this guy has disappeared off the face of the planet. Nobody has heard from him since about the stories that I was reading. Uh, the bylaw 
had to go in and shut down. I, I, I remember when the property where I used to live, that was condemned. They kicked everybody out and uh, another, a different property company came in, redid it all and like doubled the rent, right? They gentrified the place. But I didn't know it was because he's just disappeared. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And he, I mean, he's, he's got a string of unpaid taxes, unpaid bills, whatever. And some people have theorized that he's living in Costa Rica now. So, because apparently he is rumored to have owned a property there too. But, uh, <laughs> wow. Um, and another reason that he was so notorious was that he had, I guess it was an affair gone wrong. Uh, there was a guy who apparently this guy had a job and he got caught selling drugs to the RCMP and he blamed Terry Good for selling him out. And I, I guess they were in some kind of a relationship at the time. Um, and his, yeah, his lover traveled all these, shot him four times with a shotgun, left him for dead on his own porch, right? So this is why this, <laughs> I, I mean, there is, there is such a crime novel here waiting to happen. But yeah, so this guy's just completely disappeared. And that was, uh, that's it as far as the landlords that I've had in 20 years, right? What do you do with that? So... Anyway, I don't know where I was going with that. I just thought it was an interesting story to tell. <laughs> so it's been a long week and a rough week. I mean, yesterday just about killed me because I found out that my landlords that are also trying to evict me are also selling the building. So my personal feeling is that the property manager, part of her desperation to try and evict me stems from wanting to get me out of there so that they can renovate and... Um, and use my unit as kind of the show place while they renovate and still try to get around the rules about rent eviction. And there are specific laws. If you're going to rent evict somebody, they have the right of first refusal and they're entitled to compensation and so on. And I was never offered anything like that. So, hmm. So, yeah. Shady, shady, shady all over. But that's just conjecture on my part. I have no proof of it. And it would be the kind of thing that would be really hard to uh, to prove as far as my landlord goes. So I spent yesterday kind of running around trying to make the place look like, you know, <laughs> all of the cupboards and closets hadn't just been pulled out because we're organizing. And that's another weird thing is that my property manager seems to have this weird, either either she's got somebody on an, on the inside telling her these things but she always seems to show up at my door the same day we get a notice of a hearing this happened the last time too last back in september like that's just weird to me because <laughs> what is she going to do i mean what is the point of showing up on the day of a hearing for an inspection when it's going to be another two or three weeks till the actual hearing date and there's a lot that I can accomplish in three weeks and then show show the board. And so she, she shows up three weeks ago and says, look at how horrible this is. And then I go, yeah, but it's been three weeks. Look at it now, right? I mean, anyway, <laughs> this is just me kind of yap, yap, yapping. I should probably stop talking and tell you what I'm here to review. So this week I read uh, Bring Her Back by Jeff Strand. Jeff Strand is an American author, and he writes mostly uh, horror comedy type stuff. Oh, where was I going with that? Oh, Jeff Strand writes comedy stuff, uh, mostly horror, but he also does crime, YA. I think he's written some kids' books, some different types of things, and he also wrote a memoir, which I have picked up, but I might, it, I might still read that. Apparently it is not something called Nonfiction November. I don't know. So the reason I picked Get Her Back or Bring No Bring Her Back, I think I should Bring Her Back, it's called. It's been a long night. <laughs> uh the reason I picked Bring Her Back was that I follow Jeff over on Facebook and 
he posted a, a really bad review that he got. And he's like, it's like a one star and, it, and just called, called the story absolute trash, garbage. Well, you know, I'm always here for some trash. So I thought, hey, <laughs> I'll throw my opinion into the mix. So it's not trash. I enjoyed it. And I read a story, another book of his called uh, Autumn Bleeds Into Winter. And this was last about this time last year. I don't know. Maybe we should make it Jeff Strand November. <laughs> um, and what it seems like Jeff Strand does is he takes sort of common horror crime plots and he makes them twistier and he sort of sets up an expectation and then kind of keeps playing around with it. And I really like that because that makes the books, you know, they sort of subvert our expectations and they, they make it more interesting. You keep reading. And there are a lot of, even, even a book that's, that starts out fairly lighthearted and then just gets darker and darker and darker the way that uh, Bring Her Back does. Um, it still has uh, these elements of surprise and a lot of elements of, of comedy, you know, because he is known as a, a horror comedy type writer. So Bring Her Back is about this guy named Frank who, he's big, he's scary, he's funny looking. Women don't pay attention to him. Um, because of his looks, he's probably kind of, he's one of those people that sort of flies under the radar of a lot of people. You know, he's never been a big success, uh, and a whole lot of his social problems also stem from the fact that when he was younger, uh, his father shot up his workplace, uh, what we used to call going postal, and killed 11 people. And when people find this out about him, they, I mean, they avoid him because, like, how, how do you deal with, with that guy, right? <laughs> I, I don't know. And um, that's another thing that I, I've I noticed about Jeff Strand's stuff is he sort of sets up these scenarios that make you ask, you know, what would you do in this, in this position? What, what would you do? Um, so Frank meets this girl named Abigail. She sells flowers. She has this little business and, uh, they start a relationship and he's so surprised that here's this lady that likes him for the first time, possibly the first time in his life. There's somebody, you know, that's paying him some attention. Hey, it's great. And they've actually got a really, really cute relationship. She's really down to earth and she's not, you know, worried about him. And he, he tells her about his past and, you know, and, and she's not freaked out by it, which is quite charming. And she's, she's not a perfect person by any means, but she's, she's a pretty cool character. She's somebody that you really, you know, you start thinking, yeah, this is great. These, these guys should get together. But of course, this is, this is a horror novel. And, uh, you know, the most likable people in the book are ob obviously going to be the ones that we're not going to be able to be attached to very long. And I don't like that. <laughs> I just thought of something that kind of made me laugh at myself. I'll get to that. So it turns out that Frank also has a little bit of a shady, uh, sordid past. Well, maybe not a past, but he has done some work as a, sorry, my nose is dripping. So he's done some work as like a, like a, a heavy for this guy, Mark, that lives in his building and Mark is a drug dealer. And Mark is involved with some very shady people. So on one of the nights that Frank is supposed to go on a date with Abigail, Mark shows up covered in blood. And it turns out he's ripped off the people, you know, and this is not good. <laughs> this isn't good for Frank, and this isn't good for Mark. All right, so now now come the spoilers, in case you, uh, you know, you want to turn off here. So Frank gives up Mark, but just as Mark is leaving, 
something possesses Frank and he ends up killing one of the drug dealers and maiming the other one. Throws them both in his bathtub. And then it's like, well, now what do I do? <laughs> so he goes and he looks at their, uh, at their car, finds a big bag full of money, which is what everybody was after in the first place, of course. Because isn't that always what it's about? So then the people that, you know, the money belongs to, they come after him. And they're like, well, you know, why are you protecting that piece of shit? And it turns out that, yeah, the most likable person in the whole book is the person that they've captured to, you know, to try and, and be leverage for him. So he manages to find his way out of it. He manages to find the people that capture her, but unfortunately it is too late. So then what started as sort of a light story. So we go from something of a, lo a love story to a crime story to a revenge story. And it, and it, you know, it says that, but you, you're not expecting it until it actually happens, which is, is one of the interesting narrative, uh, narrative tricks that uh, Jeff Strand uses. And then where another story would end with him either killing the bad guys or being killed himself, you have a double subversion, which is that he gets captured by the people that he's trying to wreak revenge on. And then that's the part that they call a horror story. And it is pretty gruesome. So the other part that, the other thing that I really enjoyed about the way that the narrative is structured is that Frank for whatever reason, has over time developed a little bit of an obsession with the victims of his father's shooting spree. And he's got all of the walls, his wall is covered with clippings and pictures. And, and he said, yeah, anybody that went in there and saw that would think he was some kind of serial killer, but he's not. You know, this is, in whatever ways, this is kind of his therapy. And he says that what he does is he makes up little stories about each of them, just where the story goes, but the story never quite ends because he doesn't... You know, he, he doesn't create whole narratives. He just says, this person does this, and then the stories kind of leave off at that point, which is introduced, and then you kind of forget about it for a few chapters. And then as he starts his revenge, he starts making up these stories about these, these criminals. And the stories are pretty funny, actually. <laughs> Except I do not like stories where the dog dies, even if the dog is imaginary. Meh. Um, so yeah, it was, it was pretty well paced and it was pretty, it wasn't garbage. <laughs> Even though I picked it up, I thought, hey, maybe I can save this for Garbogus, but no, it wasn't garbage. Um, and the character Frank is, he's an ambiguous character because he's not, I mean, he's not somebody you automatically root for. You kind of do at first, but. He gets less and less likable as, as the narrative happens. And then, and he flat out admits, you know, he's not a nice guy. He's not a good guy. Yeah. You're going to hate him for this, but this is what he does. And then the, that's what raises that question of, you know, what would you do in this scenario? Which is always the bigger kind of philosophical questions. And there's nothing, you know, there's no attempt to glamorize it or romanticize it or anything. You feel kind of bad for the guy because Abigail, and I think Abigail's the one that you really feel bad for, because she, she never did anything. Um, and you know that it's never really going to make up for, for the true loss here, right? And I think that's why that person called it trash. <laughs> and also because the, the scenario at the end does get a little bit far-fetched, but... Um, but whatever, I mean, it's a story, right? Uh, and I think, yeah, like, it was the ending probably that makes it unexpected, but also does make it a little bit less plausible than it's been to this point. And also the fact that, I mean, these are hardened killers, and this is just some schmuck who, uh, 
shouldn't be good at hiding, but still somehow manages to uh, finagle his way out of these scenarios. And and every so often I did hear the uh, the pitch meeting guy going, super easy, barely an inconvenience. And that, that did kind of undermine it a little bit. That's why we got four stars instead of a higher rating. But uh, but yeah, overall it was a pretty enjoyable read. I read it in one night, which is unusual for me because I don't usually uh, read that quickly. Um, but yeah, if, if you enjoy that kind of stuff and you like twists and turns and um, definitely worth checking out uh, this book or some more of Strand's work. And I'll probably be doing the same. Hope you're reading lots of horror. Have a great day.